I'm Joe Foster, co-founder of Reebok with my brother. We took it from a very small company up to a billion dollars. And we're one of the passionate few. I did a lot of interviews and I always enjoy them. But this one with Omar has been great because it's searching and I hope it brings out something that an entrepreneur wants to hear and wants to feel. And if it does that much, then great. Hey guys, welcome to this very special episode of The Passion of You. Today we have on none other than Joe Foster. He's one of the founders of Reebok that took it from zero, just an idea with his brother, to a worldwide multi-billion dollar brand that you've seen on some of the most elite athletes on the planet. And while the story started decades ago, very few people have heard the full story in its entirety until recently, as the new book Shoemaker by Mr. Foster has just come out. You guys got to check it out. And so I'm honored and privileged to have him on the show today to share his incredible story of going from zero and breathing his passion for Reebok into reality. Thanks so much for being on the show today, Joe. Thank you for the invitation, Omar. It's a pleasure. It really is. I'm looking forward to this. Likewise, likewise. And I want to get into it just for the sake of, of context. You started the company of Reebok when you were about, I believe you and your brother were about 23, 25 years old, correct? Spot on. Absolutely. Yes. When we were totally young and indestructible. <laughs> so so take me back. Before you built it to, to where it is now, and I believe today what revenues in the billions, right? I think just between four and five billion in revenue as of current. And I believe when you left the company, if I'm not mistaken, it was in the late eighties, early nineties, it was already doing almost what, nine billion in revenue or so? No, we were, we were talking about the, when I left the company, the end of 1989. And at that time, mm -hmm. the company was doing four billion. I think now with uh, well, being together with Adidas that uh, the company is now down to about two billion. And mm -hmm. uh, Adidas, of course, uh, uh, have decided now to sell the company. And I think this gives uh, Reebok another opportunity now to get up to those uh, better figures. Get back to four, maybe the nine billion that uh, you've been suggesting we should be at. <laughs> I love it. Now, take me back. When you and your brother started the company prior to that, had, had you guys been entrepreneurs? Had you started other companies? Where did the entrepreneurial hunt for you begin as a kid or in your youth? Or was that your first company? Well, I don't know if you've read the book, but of course, the, uh, the Foster family goes back way, way back. And uh, we can really, the best part is to go back to my grandfather, who made for himself a pair of spiked running shoes in 1895. That's a long time. You know, we're talking 125 years ago now. And he, <laughs> and he is inventing the spike. So, um, yes, grandfather was an entrepreneur. No, I don't think the word was in the dictionary then, but uh, he definitely was. And he, he knew how to sell his company. He used to give shoes to uh, leading athletes. And I think by 19, 1904, he set his company going in 1900. 1904, he had three world records mm. to his name and his shoes. Um, and he got lots of Olympic gold medals as well. Uh, we can go forward to the uh, second decade, World War I. Who wanted running shoes? Nobody. So the company were repairing army boots from, uh, from France, and that took them more or less that decade. It was uh, the 1920s. That was uh, my grandfather's belly pop. He was really at the top of his game then. Uh, and we have uh, a letterhead. We've got, uh, you know, we have duplications of it. Um, but on it, he says that he supplied all the Olympic teams at Antwerp in 1920. Mm. And so all the way through the 20s, uh, he was famous for supplying lots of teams, the American teams, the German teams, all the way through. Um, and we had, I don't know if you've heard of Chariots of Fire. Chariots I've of heard Fire. of Chariots of Fire, yes. Yeah. Well, that, that, that immortalized uh, three athletes, Eric Liddell, Harold Abrams, and Lord Burley. They all won Olympic gold medals, and mm -hmm. he supplied them with their shoes during the 20s. They, they won their gold medals in my grandfather's shoes. So that's some history. Mm -hmm. and, then, yeah, and if we talk about entrepreneur, he was the entrepreneur. However, he died in 1933. Mm -hmm. I wasn't born until 1935. I was born 15 months after he died, but I was born on his birthday. So wow. I was born on the 18th of May. Yeah. yeah. So, of course... My grandmother, who was quite a firebrand, uh, she insisted I brought my name with me. So that's why I'm called Joe. He was Joe. I am Joe as well. So wow. I didn't know my grandfather. 
But unfortunately, in 1933, his, my father and uh, my uncle, they took over running the company. And I think this is where there was a, a lack of entrepreneurship. What they, they seemed to be just working the same routines, the same shoes that, uh, that Granddad had made. And uh, we can go through, born in 1935, by mm -hmm. 1939, we had World War II. So I'm only four years old, and all of a sudden we're in darkness, and we have six years of World War II. Lots of different adventures go on in that time, but I'm 10 years old. When they switch the lights on again, oh, you know, we, we see a different world. And for the next seven years, great, I have education, I go to college, and I spend one year in the J.D. Foster factory. Mm -hmm. Before, at 18 years of age, off I have to go to do two years of national service. So I'm in the Air Force. My Jeff had went to the same time as well. He'd been deferred. That's why he, he writ later going to me, but we went at the same time. Um, it was your brother, Jeff. We, Jeff is your brother. My Jeff. brother, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah we, we made the company. And we spent then two years mm -hmm. away from the family. And that two years made a difference. Uh, Jeff was in Germany. He saw Adidas, he saw Puma, he saw what was happening. So two years later, we come back. And we come back to the family firm and we're looking at the company and we, we see a failing company. Mm -hmm. it's, it's dying. Mm -hmm. They don't have any sales representatives. They don't have any marketing plans. They have nothing. They're just relying on the same business turning over. But meanwhile, Adidas, Puma, others are beginning to take the business. So mm -hmm. the business is getting smaller. And I'm saying to Dad, Dad, look, we've got to change. You know, we, we've got to get some plans. We've got to get some sales. We've got to change our ideas. Mm -hmm. But he didn't get on at all with his brother. In fact, they fought more times than they would speak. Mm -hmm. And Jeff and I had to pull them apart on occasion. We know Adi Dassler and Rudy Dassler. They mm -hmm. were the same, but Rudy left. And Rudy set up Puma. And Adi, of course, continued with, Adi, with Adidas. But... Uh, this never happened at Foster's. And try as we might. This was 1955 when we came out of the forces. By 1958, all our efforts in vain, we decided that was decision time for, for leaving. So we left the company to set up our own company. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the spirit was, was probably... Your father upset? Was your father upset with you at that time that you guys went off to start your own company? I don't know if you've read the book. <laughs> well, well I, I have read the book, but um, the reason I ask these questions is because I know a lot of the audience may have not read it yet. So I want to really oh, share yeah. from, a, from a perspective of as if we know nothing and the audience yeah. is sort of unraveling the story here with you. <laughs> Quite. I understand that. I was just <laughs> want yeah. to know where we are with the story. Yeah, well, father was upset because uh, whilst we, we wanted him to come with us, we wanted him to, come on, let's leave the company then and let's set up a new company together. But all he would say is, look, when I'm gone and your uncle's gone, this company can be yours. Do what you want with it. Mm -hmm. And of course, the only answer to that was, I'm sorry, Dad. Number one, don't want you to go. You know, we're not, we're not looking for you to die so that we can inherit a company. <laughs> but... Yeah, there would be no company mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, by the time you go, this company is going to die first. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess he didn't really believe that we, were, we would actually go and leave and set up our own company. But uh, on, that, on that particular day, it was, uh, it was quite a, a traumatic day. Mm -hmm. And uh, apart from the fact that he picked up the uh, letter opener and I thought he was coming towards me. He said he, he, get, he was giving it to me. He said, stab me now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is not what we're after. We're, we're really, what we're trying to do is to make a living, find a life, make something happen. Uh, yeah. So that, that was a bit traumatic at the point. I, funnily enough, you know, Jeff didn't get the blame for that. He, I, I, I know I was the one that would go in there and do all the talking. And so I went in and said, we're going. But, and Jeff was still living at home. I, I had left the, uh, the family home. I, I, I was married and just bought a, a nice bungalow. So leaving the company meant we had to sell the bungalow, pay for some machinery. And so there we are in 1958. It was late 1958. We set up our Mercury Sports Football in the next town in an old brewery. 
And from there, from there, were you in uh, Jeff off to the races or was it a series of false starts or did you guys have big plans? I mean, obviously we we've seen what Reebok grew to, but at the time in your twenties, were you guys just trying to get the company to, you know, maybe a few million bucks in revenue or did you dream of doing something big in the world and blasting it? I mean, was your ambition hungry? Where mindset wise, what was you and Jeff's intention when you started the company on your own? How big did you aspire to make the company? I guess the frustration of being at uh, J.W. Foster and nothing happening, this is what was driving our motivation to leave. And um, when we left, we left knowing that we had to determine our own future um, because it wouldn't happen at the family business. So I think that was the motivation. We, we needed to determine our future. We knew sports football. The family had been involved in it for many years, so we had a good history. You know, we, we were okay. So, no, we didn't dream of millions. We didn't dream of anything that big. Uh, just to um, set up a company, um, let's go for it. And, and of course, once you start doing that, and you start feeling the, uh, well, you know, we can make it. We, we knew we could make it. We, we knew, and you know, business started to grow quite nicely. But uh, also what's in the book, of course, we started to face many of the problems. First problem we faced, was the fact that we'd, we'd been going about 18 months, nearly two years, when our accountant said, OK, boys, you're doing all right. You're making a bit of money, but you better register that name. <laughs> what do you mean, register the name? Well, look, if somebody else wants to make, uh, sees that you're doing so good, uh, starts making running shoes and cycle shoes uh, using the name Mercury, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have to go to court with that because you're going to have to prove that you started it first. Oh, right. So how do we do that? Right, we go and see a, a specialist. And uh, so we give the specialist the questions, please register our name, Mercury. Uh, it's pre-registered. Ooh, pre-registered. What do we do? Well, the guy said, I'll ask the people because they're not using it, mm. but they've got it registered. So they offered it to us for a thousand pounds. You could probably think of maybe, I don't know, maybe a million dollars today. I don't know what it would be equivalent to, but we didn't have a thousand pounds. We had <laughs> more near a thousand pounds to, to spare on buying the name. So uh, we said, look, if we can't buy it or you don't want to fight it in court, because like I said, how much would it cost us to fight it in court? <laughs> he said about a thousand pounds. So <laughs> we're back with the same number, the impossible number. <clears throat> so he said, go Bring me, bring me half a dozen names, a dozen names. Uh, I said, we'll, we'll test them out with the, uh, with the registrar. And I said, how can we bring you a dozen names? We, you know, we, there's got to be our name. Anyway, we go back. We get names on the paper like Falcon and uh, you know, animal names as well. What, what, we had a whole list of these. But 1948... It was during the war, 1948, no, it would be 1942. I was eight years old. During the war, 43, that's the number. 1943, during the war, and I won a race. I thought, race, great. I had one big advantage. I was wearing spike shoes. Mm. Right? Nobody those days had spikes on the shoes. So winning a race, you know, everybody, wow, brilliant. I could win races in spikes. And what was my prize? My prize was a dictionary, but it was a Webster's dictionary. <clears throat> and a Webster's dictionary is an American dictionary. I didn't know that at the time. <clears throat> I was more disappointed with the fact that they thought I needed a dictionary. And <laughs> that was it. I got a dictionary. But here we are. We, we move forward now to 1960. Uh, we're looking for names, and I pick up my dictionary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like that letter R. I think that's strong beginning for, for a name, R. Right. So I'm looking through beginning with R in my dictionary. It doesn't take long to get to RE. It's RWE. RWE be okay. Small South African gazelle. Gazelle. Wow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> gazelle. That sounds a bit speedy. It sounds a bit like it. A good name. Why not try that? Top of the list. Back to the specialist. And I said, look, I've given you all these names. But that's the one I want. We really have to be in love with this. It's got to be our passion mm -hmm. because we, we need it to work. He tested this out with the registrar and 
Reebok was the only one that came out that we could actually use. Mm. Brilliant, fantastic. We got it. So that's how we came Reebok. However, the registrar, in his wisdom, came out with the point that, uh, look, we've got to put you in the B section of the register. And we said, what's the B section? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, he said, if anybody starts making shoes out of Reebok skin, I can't stop them. You can't stop them. Right. 20 years later, he came back and said, look, guys, uh, we moved you to the A section because Reebok now is a shoe. It is not an animal anymore. <laughs> wow that's incredible so you took it you took it for, you almost redefined an entire uh, word in history <laughs> with what you guys breathe into it that's amazing now now let me ask you this um when you guys first put out the shoes and first take off with Reebok I know that throughout the series of growths of the company there was certain um you know times of fortune or luck meaning, um, you know, aerobics and running in particular, you guys caught on to good trends that kind of helped catapult the company. But when you first started with Reebok, I mean, what was year one, year two, year three? Was it a series of just selling to local uh, mom and pop shops locally? Did you have a vision to kind of go global? I mean, where, where was the trajectory, say year one, year two, year three with you and Jeff? Was, did you guys catch momentum or was there a lot of time where you're like, oh, what are we doing? Should we shut down the company? Or was it a passion that you just knew you were playing the long game with? Um, take me back to maybe those first three or four years and um, you know what you guys were going through mentally. Well, I guess as far as we were concerned, it was a matter of just growing the business, becoming known, putting, putting your product back there. And uh, we, we were doing quite nicely. In fact, we were doing too well with cycle shoes. And, uh, and we were really doing well. We, we, we had an agent down in London who was sending more orders than we could cope with. And all of a sudden, those orders. How were you, how are, how are you guys getting into stores to begin with? You had already had relationships and kind of knew the business because of your family's lineage in the business? Or how did you guys start getting them into you know, stores. You start getting into that by, okay, you need a salesman. You need somebody to go call. You need to do some advertising uh, mm -hmm. because your advertising is to your consumer. Mm -hmm. I think your athletes or your cyclists or whatever, that's where your advertising goes. But you need to take on agents, sales agents, either employ them or you, you can put them on a commission. And we started with commission agents. So we advertised in the magazine, we'll say a cycle magazine for cycling, for somebody who handles cycle shops, and Athletics Weekly for the athletic shop. And we've got this guy in London. So that's how we started our business. Okay, you know, we, we'd already said that J.D. Wood Fosters, you need to get salesmen, you need, you need to look at how do you sell. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think marketing that in those days was again, was a word, it's like entrepreneur. A market, the, the words which have progressed, they've come out. We know what the difference is now between selling and marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. In those days, it was, we've got to sell shoes. Marketing, I suppose, was the advertising. And, and so, yeah, we got the agents and we were doing very nicely, but our agent in London suddenly stopped. Um, we didn't have mobiles. So, you know, we didn't, didn't have any computers or anything like that. Uh, we had to rely on letters. We did have a telephone, uh, but it, it was like people had to connect you. It's amazing when you, when you think back, that it was so sort of primitive in, in our, so we're writing letters and we're wondering what's happened to our agent. We, we did get a letter from his landlady about uh, three weeks after these orders had stopped that he'd been killed in a road accident. That killed our cycling uh, line, almost dead, almost dead. But fortunately, you know, Jeff used to do cycling. He was also in the athletics club. All the local athletes were coming to us. So we had a nice business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I thought, I'll get out there on the road and do some selling. I did. Mm -hmm. I'm going Nobody could tell me how to make our product. And I could tell you anything about the product. I, I'm not a salesman. Not <laughs> at all. Salesman. That's not me. Uh, but I, I could go out there and talk about my product. And I, I would go into the sports shops. <clears throat> and some would be very good. Yes, yes, we were, we were doing rugby boots as well. So it, we had a nice business. And I could sell. But a lot of these uh, retails, these small sports shops, they would say, uh, who? Reebok? Yeah, Reebok. Okay, well, what do you do? Well, here's the product. Show them plan. And they just point to the shelf. So look, I've got Adidas and I've got Dunlop. Why do we need Reebok? Mm -hmm. That resonated with me because it wasn't just one, it was a lot. <laughs> Why do I need Reebok? They didn't need Reebok. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I recognized the fact that Adidas were big on soccer. So that was, that was a space we, we couldn't go into. We had a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of money. We had more energy than money. Um, and so uh, I was saying, well, we, we used to go out to athletics meetings, mm-hmm. open up the back of the car and sell out to the boot of the car and, and people would buy our product. And I'm thinking, but these are, these are, these are our customers. Now, luckily, and I, I think it's the same in America, we had the three A's, the Amateur Athletic Association. They had a book. And in that book was the name of every secretary of every club in the country, probably 300, 400. Wow. But it didn't take much thinking about it, did it? There's a letter, there. <laughs> a letter to every secretary, become an agent, we'll give you 15% off. I got a lot of agents. And what that did for our company, not only did we get sales, it gave us immeasurable sort of um, respectability. We became the athletic shoe company. Mm. That was us. You want an athletic shoe? Yes, you can go to Reebok. So we really became that company. We were athletic shoes. But I'm thinking this is this is okay, but you know, we we need to where do we go from here? Athletics in the sports industry is not a big not a big volume uh, business. Right. It's it's a good business and fine we were making that money, but it's not a big volume. We we need to get America. Well in America, I mean every college, every university, coach. Mm-hmm. Coach is God. And uh, you you get a scholarship. Uh, for sports, you know, an athletic scholarship, you can go fine. So that's that's the big market. I mean, previous to us, Foster's had been selling to Yale, Bob G and Jack and Frank Ryan were head coaches at Yale, and they were they were buying two hundred pairs a month of the Foster's Deluxe Spikes. Well, that was okay, but Frank Ryan and Jack they were getting old. In fact, it, it right. was time for them to uh, check out. <laughs> which they did do. So we couldn't take that business when Foster's eventually did fold. Um, but I wanted America. And I'm, I'm reading a magazine. It's a sports magazine. And it's an advertisement from the government. The British government want you to export your shoes. Well, in America in particular, what would they do? Well, they, they were ready to uh, pay for a stand at the NSGA show, the National Sporting Goods Association of America. In Chicago, they pay for the stand. They pay for our return at first. Wow. And they, pay, and they pay half of our hotel bill. Wow. Cheaper than staying at home. And they <laughs> and they would do that. They would do that with the intention of what would be in it for them. They were trying to get companies to kind of expand into the US. Gotcha. Well, yeah. yeah. Export. I mean, in, in those days, I mean, even today, you know, if you're a producer of anything, if you can export it, then it increases uh, incomes. Everything increases, so they were happy to do that. This is 1968. And, and how, uh, how old are you? How old are you at this stage, or how long had the company been going when you got this opportunity? To 1968. Go to we've been going ten years. So we've been years. Okay. developing our business ten years. And 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 revenue wise, revenue wise, where were you year ten, give or take? You know, if you could just give a trajectory. You know, what did you do in revenue year one versus where you were at year ten, give or take? Oh. I don't think anybody counted in those days, but by year 10, we were still less than one, one million pounds. So mm-hmm. we were still quite a small company. One million pounds in those days, let me think, about $2 million. Gotcha. In those days. Because and and at, at that time, were you and your brother, were you and your brother pretty organized and good with the numbers or was it kind of chaotic trying to figure everything out, learning about lawyers and manufacturing? Obviously you had the experience from your family but were you and your brother kind of just figuring it out as you go, trying different things, you know, taking imperfect action? The reason I ask this is because there's a lot of entrepreneurs watching this who, you know, they get stuck trying to build a company and they go, well, I don't know how to run advertisements or I don't know how to get my market or message out there to my market or, you know, they're plagued by fear, but I'm sure you, you guys had a lot of those fears, but took imperfect action in the process of it. I mean, take me back. Like, was there, did you guys know what you were doing or were you guys kind of figuring it out as you went and bumping into the walls? And was it a, a bumpy first, you know, five, 10 years with the company? A lot of the early days, yes, you just bump around because you, you don't know where to go. You have no business experience. All we had experience is how to make a product, how to sell it, how to grow a company. Those are different things. You know, don't even enter your head. You know, growth will come naturally. It's something that happens. That, you know, as, it, as you sell more, you grow. <clears throat> so it was only uh, thinking about we have to expand our business. 
you know, we can move into other categories, but football, soccer, soccer was not something we could move into. So we, we were left with athletics. How do we expand athletics? That was, the idea. I knew it was America. We, we've got to get into America. That's the big one. And here up comes a nice offer that you can go to America, don't to pay for the stand. You can't refuse that. And so my first trip over to America was Chicago. Mm-hmm. February, you can imagine. I'm from the UK. <laughs> yeah. We used to, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, we used to rain. Rain is okay. This was snow, ice, freezing. <clears throat> oh, wait, was it freezing? Um, however, this was the opportunity. <clears throat> you know, I have a stand there, and a friend of mine had come along with me. I, I made a climbing boots for him. He was an outdoor. Right? I made climbing boots. And so we set up the stand, great, excellent. And I get a lot of people coming on saying, oh, like your product, that's nice. Yes, where do I get it from? And I hand them a card and they say, England, is that New England? No, 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 it's, it's across the water, you know, <clears throat> England. And they say, near London? Well, yes, that's, <laughs> that's about it. <clears throat> but no, they didn't seem to, uh, uh, that seemed a lot too much work, that. You know, an unknown brand, why would we want to spend our time and our energy in doing that? So it didn't happen. So I have to move forward. I just shift forward to 1979, 96, that's 11 years. And I was going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, doing the American trip all the time with the product. And I had about six different attempts with different people. Yeah, we'll try your product. Didn't work. Failed all the time, failing. Why were we failing? <clears throat> well, we needed a hook. We needed something that uh, the American uh, public or running public would want to buy us. Now, this is where a lot of luck comes in. 1968 was early days for running. But during the 70s, running became a massive category. It grew and grew incredibly. <clears throat> Nike grew on the back of it. Nike were part of the growth. The other one was Runner's World. And Runner's World magazine started with just a single page, but by the mid-1970s, it was one big, glossy, nice magazine that was telling everybody what shoes they should buy. They, they, they knew. They were, everybody bought that magazine. And, in fact, Bob Anderson decided that he would start to uh, rate shoes, and he would tell you which was the number one shoe. If you became a number one shoe... That was already at least one million pairs of shoes, at least. Wow. So their syndication was huge at that point. Their influence was huge at that stage. Just big influence. Everybody yeah. read the magazine. So everybody was influenced by this. And, uh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that in the first one, it was Nike. Nike was chosen. Right. Could he, could he get a million shoes all of a sudden? <clears throat> all of a sudden, can he, can he go? No. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, he's dealing with uh, Onitsuka in in uh, in Japan, <laughs> and, and you know, Mister Onitsuka would think about it. So, so. But you know, they couldn't expand their production that quick. So by the time by the time the production's arriving and he's getting the shoes and he's getting to the retailers, we're nearly another twelve months down the road. What mm-hmm. happens? Another number one shoe. Oh, this only happened to. Everybody piled in on uh, on Bob Anderson of Runners World said he can't do this to us. This is this is murder. So somebody suggested let's have a star rating instead of a, a number one, two, three. So with a star rating, five star shoe, that would be the top. It could be three, four shoes. Right. My opportunity. <clears throat> I knew it would have been difficult to actually make a number one shoe, mm-hmm. but I knew we could make a five star shoe. Mm. Uh, that was Aztec. I knew we could do that. We knew Bob Anderson. We knew everything. You, know, you, you do research. You really go into these things, and you know. And and of course, uh, you know Nike were there, and we knew the way that Nike were working. So we knew we could make a a, a five star shoe. And at that stage, did you have a relationship with Runners World and Bob Anderson at all, or did you did you from scratch have to forge a relationship, build a relationship there to kind of get Reebok in the magazine? Well, you could advertise, which meant you paid for advertising. Any, anybody could advertise a magazine, which we did do. Uh, we also went on uh, 
once we were in Chicago, moved on from Chicago to uh, Los Altos, I think it, where, um, um, where Bob Anderson was with his publication. And we actually visited him and had a really good chat with him. And so we got to know him, yes. Uh, it, and took him some shoes, it. took him a pair of shoes, I'm sure. <laughs> he gave him a few pairs of shoes, yeah. But, yeah. you know, that's what you could do in life. You've got to find your route. <laughs> and we, we knew that uh, this would be the hope. If we could get a bad statue, we knew. Um, 1978, Commonwealth Games in Edmonton. We had our three gold range shoes. The gold range was Aztec. That was the trainer. That was the one that would be the boat. Midas, that was a road racing shoe. And we had Inca, that was track spike. We got a lot of gold medals. We really do well there. So by February of 1979, I have my five-star shoe right now. And I have it on my stand. And came out, come along and say, we want 25,000 pairs. Well, right. Well, that's half a year's work for our factory. That, <laughs> but, but we knew that if we got a five-star shoe, we knew we have to find something. So I had a good friend, a good friend who'd been with me a long time, who was now working with Barter. He was head of their uh, sports division. But we, we can make your shoes, Joe. Don't worry about it. We'll make your shoes if you get a big order. To say. But then came who out ordered, wanted, who ordered the 25,000? Who ordered the 25,000 shoes? Came out. Came out, wanted to yeah. order. Came out. I think you know came out. Yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. Yes. <laughs> So they, they ordered 25,000 yeah. units and you guys well, went, oh, holy cow, we got to figure this out. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But then came out and said, but we wanted a better price. Ah. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course you wanted a better price. But again, we were ready for that because now the footwear industry is going to the Far East. It's going to Taiwan, South Korea, and Indonesia. It's all moving out there. And they, they could make the shoes up there for less than half the price we could make them back in the UK. Oh. Mm -hmm. right. But you know, I was also talking to people who were agents out there. And so you know, we, we, we had things steady. We had it right. It's like, okay, if it happens, it happens. Okay, so this is only February of 1979, and we're waiting for the issue to come out in August. But whilst I'm there at, uh, at the NSGA show, Paul Feynman comes along. Paul Feynman from Boston. He had a company, Boston Camping. And he was running that company with his brother and his, uh, and his brother-in-law. And I could see it on Paul's face. He wasn't really happy to keep on going around that so selling tents, fishing rods, and all the bits and pieces. And yeah, you know, he, he, just, he just wanted a change. He wanted something different. And he said, Joe, look, I'd, I'd love to be your agent. because, And I preferred this working with somebody. I'm working with someone like Kmart you know, who work on footage, square footage. And if you don't come up to sales on square footage, you're out. So we weren't that big a company. You know, we were simple thinkers. It's like, you know, sell a shoe, sell another shoe, sell another shoe. And so Paul Feynman was, would have been my man. Okay. But Paul said, look, you know, if you're going to do this, I need a five star. Paul, come on. Look at this. This is Aztec. This is going to be a five star shoe. Well, I may have been persuasive or not. I'm not a good salesman, so I didn't sell him at that point. But he said, look, if you get a five-star shoe, I'm, I'm your man. Right. Last week in July, this is when the uh, sort of August issue comes out of Runner's World. And I phoned Paul, Paul, please, go down to the local kiosk and buy Runner's World. Let's see where we are. Took him an hour to come back on this one. I think it was a bit early in the morning. Midday for me, but it was only early morning for Paul. And uh, an hour later, he came back, he said, Joe, Aztec, five stars. Wow. That was it. We had the hook. We, that, was, that was the magic. He said, well, oh, just a minute. He said, Midas, Inca, also five stars. So we had three five-star shoes in those categories. That was it. That opened the door. And Paul was in business. Wow. And how long into having the company did you guys get those three shoes to be ready for market at five-star level? The <clears throat> what, 10, 15 years or something at that stage? At that stage, we're talking about 1979. We've been there, that's 21 years, isn't it? 21 years, wow. From 58. And, and yes. where, was, where was the biggest explosion in sales? Because I know I've seen a few of your interviews where you talked about the fact that you marvel that you weren't the best at sales, that you focused more on marketing and being strategic 
and you said that your skill is finding the opportunities where luck is. <laughs> You're good at seeing where <laughs> luck is. Um, if you can smell it, I hope yes, go there. <laughs> yes. Um, did you find did you find that there was um, moments of grace where like as an entrepreneur, maybe your success wasn't linear, right? It wasn't a straight shut up. It was kind of like all over the place. But then you hit a gold mine and then boom, you have these explosions um, in sales. The first of which I believe um, was catching on to these trends and, and you were mentioning um, in, in other interviews. And now what was the biggest spike in sales for the first time where it was like, whoa, this was like. The, the biggest thing we've seen in sales was it that uh, twenty five thousand order from Kmart, or was it when you guys started getting into other categories? Where did you see an explosion? We were like, "Holy cow! This this Reebok is taking off at a whole new level." Well, it wasn't Kmart. I, I couldn't believe that, uh, <clears throat> that I would be in business if I went with Kmart. I, right. You know, I thought that would be a one off end of story. Uh, they wouldn't push my shoe. It, we would have to do an awful lot of work on it to, to make it into a, a top shoe. Now, I thought that Paul, Paul Feynman in Boston, he had this nice little company, Boston Camping, where you could bolt on the Reebok product and off we go. So, you know, our, our rise had been very, very slow and very, very steady until, until we got the, uh, the running shoe, Aztec, five stars. I mean, that was it all of a sudden. But... Uh, when I went over to see Paul, Boston campaign didn't exist anymore. He, he decided that was it. And, uh, he decided he would be Reebok. Uh, his brother had decided to make wallets, so he had a lot of machinists making one. And his, his brother, as his brother, and his brother-in-law had a second-hand car lot. So, mm -hmm. so Paul was starting this together, which was really good because he, he was hungry, but he had mm -hmm. knowledge of the business. And, you know, he wasn't just dealing with a few runners. He had knowledge of the business, so that would be okay. But uh, fine. Fortunately, we did get some shoes from Barter. And in a way, fortunately, although they were not good, and instead of sending them back, Paul sold, sold all the shoes up, but he didn't pay for them. So that funded that first bit. Um, the second bit was, well, we, we got to go to the Far East. And whilst Barter had, had, had given him a credit line, the Far East don't give you a credit line. You've got to put your money down or you have to have a bank to put your money down, which means either collateral or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, it soon became clear that, that whatever money Paul had or we had, uh, we couldn't drive this business forward that much because we couldn't afford. So this is where Paul, who had friends and friends of friends that bumped into um, Stephen Rubin. Stephen Rubin is Pentland in the UK. And Stephen Rubin's business, ASCO was one of his business, but ASCO was sourcing company. And mm -hmm. they sourced out of the Far East. So Stephen came in, not for money, but for a credit line. So he gave us a credit line. Um, and that was, that was all that was needed. And the product out of the Far East was brilliant. So we had the product, we had a credit line. Then we could grow. And we're growing very nicely, really nicely. But then... We, we had a, a tech rep, Arnold mm -hmm. Martinez. I don't know if you've heard of Arnold. Arnold Martinez, remember his name. Mind you, I think he's retired now, but he's a, there's a genius. And uh, he, was a, a, he was a tech rep in LA. So mm -hmm. he goes around just to the stores. He's not to sell the shoes, but to say, this is what happens, this is how they make, you know, this is what the benefits. So he's a tech rep, but he's at home and uh, his wife is going to these aerobic classes. And uh, she seems full of it. And I was saying, what's all this about? Well, she said, this, this is exercise to music. Fantastic. Oh, this, uh, this, you know, I don't get interested. Can I come down and have a look what's going on? Yeah, come next time. And I goes down. What does he see? Instructors in running shoes. Half the class in running shoes. The other half, no shoes at all. A light bulb moment. Well, I don't know. Why don't we make a shoe for these girls? A nice uh, glove leather upper and cushion sole. Brilliant. Why do Off he goes to see Paul in Boston. Mm. And he tells Paul his story. Who Paul was. Paul is not interested. Paul says, Arnold, look, we're doing really good at running. 
this is really good. You know, our business is growing. You know, we have five stars using it and we're doing that. Why do we want to play around making shoes for some girls down in LA? who are just jumping around. Right. Arnold is not put off. Arnold, a bit sort of, oh, goes around the back door. Just to have a look at the production people and just plead with the production people. Look, guys, just make me a nice, simple shoe. Uh, it can get me 200 pairs. Mm-hmm. Well, he must have been a better salesman than me because... Uh, he got his 200 pairs wow. off down off down to uh, LA again. And he just puts these shoes with all the instructors and a few of the top girls who are involved in that. The rest is history. Okay. The first month, <clears throat> maybe longer than the first month, the shoes fell apart. They were made out of glove leather. Glove leather, you can tell like a piece of paper. And it's only one millimeter thick. We used to make world tens out of glove leather but we used to use a suede they were used in the the grain side so they had to take they had to take make it rough to get the adhesive in there which meant it was weak around the edges after four or six weeks these were falling apart were we lucky mm-hmm. yes we were in la we were in the usa the girls didn't care they loved the shoes that much they went out and bought a new pair of shoes so it made it just perfect <laughs> yeah. yeah perfect Absolutely. Yeah. It took us two or three months to get the leather thing right. But then you've got Jane Fonda wearing the shoes, buying the shoes, and wearing the shoes in her videos. And all of a how sudden... Did you get Jane Fonda, how did you get Jane Fonda to wear the shoes in her videos? It just just the momentum she, had spread to her? She, she saw the shoes. So she thought they were great, fantastic. She became a lover of the shoes. She bought her shoes. Wow. And, so, you, so, you, you, so you guys, uh, in a certain sense... Um, your growth was pioneered by what would you know now we know it as influencer marketing but at the yeah. time it wasn't it wasn't even conscious because there was no social media it was literally getting the demand in the trenches of those environments to, to the degree that Jane Fonda herself saw it was a fan and purchased the shoes as well as endorsed them Absolutely. in her video Absolutely. Wow. you must yeah. have been ecstatic when you saw him on Jane Fonda like holy cow Jeff can you believe this <laughs> Well, the, the thing is, we, we didn't have time to believe it because the business just whoop, exploded. All of a sudden, really? everybody. All, and this is, you know, Reebok. Who's Reebok? No one's knew Reebok. A few runners, yeah. We've got some runners in our shoes, of course. But we were not known like Nike and Adidas. They were male. They were sweaty. All of a sudden, the girls had this nice new Reebok brand. Beautiful brand. And this nice shoe. This is ours. And so... The women, women took possession of Reebok. And as you've got the figures, you know, we were, we were then about a nine, uh, a nine million dollar brand. And, you know, it, it then rose up to 30 million. Then uh, I think it was 90 million, 300 million, then 900 million. It was almost a billion in four or five years. That was, and we were not in control. We were not in control. It was, it was massively, so the demand was massively, growing wow. yeah you can imagine the biggest problem from 300 million to 900 million in one year where do you get your product yeah <laughs> where do you get your yeah, we... the money wasn't the problem then because that was being that was okay where do you... and it so happened at that time nike hit a wall nike suddenly mm, their business took a, a fall and they, they had to pull out of two factories mm-hmm. Reebok, just like that. Reebok went into the two factories and off it took. I mean, it was close. It was incredible. The growth. So, so holy cow. Okay, so let me get this straight, Joe. So you, how old are you at this time when the company is at 9 million um, and, and before it kind of goes to 30 and then 90 and then 100 and 300 and 900 and a billion? How old are you when the company I'm, is at 9 million in revenue? I'm about 44, 45. And then, really- and literally, what took it from nine million to thirty million was really kind of catching on to a new trend that other people weren't taking advantage of because you had Nike, Adidas, and all these other categories. But you guys had your eye, like you said, you had your eye on uh, sort of the you were looking for the opportunity of what was about to to kind of pop off, so you can ride the coattails of it to a certain degree. But was it that the market? was that big the aerobics market was that big or that it was just emerging or that it became a kind of streetwear brand i mean what was responsible for taking it from 9 million to 30 million just 
the awareness of it through aerobics or were that many people doing aerobics? I mean, what was in, in it that just exploded it? Well, right in the beginning, there, there was no market. Aerobics was simply around LA. There was something that was just developing there. So the rest of the world didn't know about it. Uh, so the, 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 the Reebok, Reebok and aerobics grew because all of a sudden women were doing something. It was, all you needed was a pair of shoes. You know, it, very simple. You know, you wanted to be in a sport. And women owned this. Okay, it, you know, it didn't take too long and the men started looking at it and saying, what's this game, what's this aerobics? Can we have a bit of that? And you know, Reebok developed that nice soft leather, which also became so influential. You know, that soft mm -hmm. leather, that looked, you know, crinkly toes. And you know, it, it was beautiful. Everybody started to love the leather and aerobics just became something massive. So wow. that's what grew. It's just like running at, at grown Nike. You know, Nike uh, w w had grown on that massive sort of uh, growth of that category. My, my father, I was um, having dinner with him last night and I told him I was actually going to be interviewing you. And he told me that uh, that Reebok, that he remembers that him and all his friends, when they heard about Reebok, that they went because one of their friends had it and they liked the leather. I don't know if it was a new buck leather or what it was, but he said that that's what made him and his friends. They went the next day and they all bought uh, pairs of Reeboks um, because of that, because of the quality of the leather, that it was different. So that's amazing to think that you... Uh, breathed life into that. Now, when the company is going from 9 million to 30 million to 90 million, like you said, um, what's going through your mind? Are you, is it excitement, enthusiasm, or are you so busy trying to manufacture and actually deliver the goods that you were too busy kind of focusing on that and scaling the business to really kind of uh, enjoy the money because you're so busy trying to fulfill the orders? I mean, where, where were you at, at that time? Or did you guys have the systems and structure in place? Um, I know you moved into those 90 factories, but yeah, I mean, you, you, you need people. You need a lot of things. Uh, the infrastructure wasn't there. It had to be built. So it was, it was crazy keeping up with it. I know, I know I sit down with Paul Fireman and Paul say, Joe, I know, how to, I know how to stop this. He said, but if I do, I don't know how to start it again. <laughs> <laughs> right. That was, that was big. So really, it was just a question of how do we keep up? How do we keep running? How do we keep going up this hill and keep sprinting? Because we had to. To, to sort of develop everything. You know, I, I was putting on global distribution. That was good. We didn't really need global distribution because the distribution in America was taking all the volumes that, that we, could, we could make. So, so it was a crazy run um, right up to the end of uh, uh, 89 when I decided, you know, time for me to retire. We were, we were then about $4 billion company, a shot of $4 billion. And, I had put on at least 30 different countries. So I'd started with Paul in America, put on at least 30 different countries. And I, I was at 35,000 feet every other week. I was flying somewhere. I, I was landing and being picked up by a limousine. I was going down to the best hotels and we were going out at night and dining at the finest uh, restaurants, at wherever you are in the world. You were, you, were, you were living the dream. You were living the dream at that stage. Yeah. And I don't say it became a nightmare. It didn't, but... Sure. The, challenge, the challenge had gone. Mm. This wasn't a challenge. This was uh, just going through the motions again. Just okay. cruising. At, it was cruising at the top. You were cruising yeah. at the top. Yeah. 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 We, were, we were in Monte Carlo. We were doing the Princess Grace uh, Foundation tennis tournaments. And all the, uh, all the people from LA, all the, you know, the A-list stars were there. Even Frank Sinatra came along on one of our occasions. You know, so, so we were mixing with, with all the stars, and it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we must have had 30 or 40 different stars each time. Uh, you know, was it surreal? Was it, was, it surreal? was it surreal to you to see, to live in the reality through your eyeballs and see this whole world of opportunity and people saying, pleasure to meet you, Joe, and looking at you in the special light and thinking that you're the guy that built this billion dollar company, everything that most people on the planet aspire to do that, you in some way breathed the dream that was just once you and your brother bickering and you know trying to figure out what should we do here is was it surreal to you uh were there moments where you got to pinch yourself and go holy cow how did a how did i how did a regular guy like me figure this out right did, were there a lot of moments like that in your career early on or have those since faded you know really it's more surreal to me now than it was at the time i think at the time everything <laughs> was bounce 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 you, you were just in 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 it, whatever it was, whether it was tennis, 
you know, whether it was being with the stars, whatever they were doing, it was just moving, moving. <clears throat> so keeping up with it was just, it, it wasn't surreal at the time. It was like, this is happening, this is happening. And now I've stepped back for quite some time and I look at it and think, how did we do that? How did that happen? You know, how did that? You know, I mean, there's a lot of happiness, a lot of things going on, but really, you know, there's, there's a lot of sadness as well because we just got into America when my brother died. You know, mm -hmm. he, he was an athlete, but he over pushed himself, whatever it was, and he got stomach cancer and died of it. And so he didn't see it. And you know, you, I'm at that point with, he just looked after production and he would have done a lot of flying. He would have been going out to Korea. He would have been doing a lot of things that I had to do as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that doubled my efforts and saying, I've got to, it's going to happen. So you, I think it drives you harder. I think it drove me harder. And I often think, well, what he would have thought you know, had, he, had he still been around with uh, how successful we were, you know, you know, and how great that, that, that journey has been. And, it, and it, it was a great journey, but I needed to get off that. I needed to come down. Yeah, and, and, and yeah of course. To, yeah. You need to enjoy your life. Yeah. Otherwise, it was, it was going to take the whole thing. Now, I want to ask you this. When it comes to entrepreneurs you see today, right? A lot of our audience are entrepreneurs, you know, in their 20s to 40s, some even older. Obviously, at this stage in your life, you've, you've spent decades. I'm sure you've met some of the most you know, successful people in the world and have rubbed elbows with people who've done really well for themselves. What are common denominators you have found, Joe, of entrepreneurs that really do well and succeed in the long run versus the ones that kind of start, stop, fail, get stuck and never quite have momentums of success? Is it mindset? Is it resilience? Would you say it's a combination of luck? I mean, what are the common denominators of, of um, success you've seen at the levels you've experienced that you could impart to our audience? What, what wisdom can you give entrepreneurs out there trying to make their dreams reality? I, I think there's a lot of things. And I think number one, start when you're young. When you're young, you're resilient, <clears throat> very resilient. And you, you, can, you can take the battery because that's what, also expect problems. Because that's going to make, that's going to drive you forward. Expect failures. That's going to drive you forward. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Don't expect it's going to be a straight line. No. You know, that gives you energy because you know if you fail, it puts one step nearer to being a success. And so expect all those things. And uh, say, be young. Expect failure. Don't take too much advice from people because they're looking ahead. You, know, you, you can ask all the questions you like about finance and whatever, but it. It will put you off. You know, you need to face the problem yourself. Okay, there's certain hurdles that maybe that you, you can get help with. Um, I think also luck and timing. You know, did you choose to be in the right place? Were you, we happened to be in the right place at the wrong time. We happened to be. Although I, I say that one thing, since 1960 or when we started 1950, right up until COVID, the sports industry has never had a recession. The sports industry has always grown and it's continuing to grow. So it is continuing to grow because not, we're, we're looking at entertainment. We're looking at influences. We're talking about influences. And sport has influenced street for a long time and is still there. And people look up and say, what is my favorite football player wearing? And, you know, you can see him in Nike or see him in Reebok, see him in Adidas. What, what is it? And so it's influences. And then you've got to look what's influencing today. If I'm going to grow, you know, you, you can grow with influences, or you can do what Jim Radcliffe did with Ineos, and you can you can be a good chemist, good scientist, and you can buy into the petrochemical world and grow a big business from from that. Yeah, but is that entertaining? No, it's not. That's why now he does so much sports events. Yeah, so he has to buy himself into sport, but he made his money a different way. Depends, mm -hmm. you know, if you're doing it from passion or if you're doing it from sort of a almost as clinical, you, you're learning. Well, we know now that um, science is so important. So if you're into science, you can probably run over that. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, what is happening now? Technology, <clears throat> you know, technology, you need to know of technology because what's happening? You know, we now have this, we're, we're on a Zoom meeting, you know, you're over there in California, I'm over here in France, and this is, you know, we could be sat at the opposite. In fact, prob you're probably nearer to me than the other side of the table. <clears throat> and we're learning, we're learning how, with, with podcasting, we're learning how to be relaxed. 
we're learning how this is this is great you know i i had to take a flight for five thousand miles to meet paul Feynman. you know but, uh, right now <clears throat> yeah we're a lot farther away but you know we, we can speak and we uh, we know such so much more social media all these things have mm -hmm. come in so entrepreneurs need to be on the ball we need to know what's going on and that either that's going to be luck and i think for me there was an awful lot of luck that we had to be in the sports industry at the time the sports industry were exploding you know, yeah and just, what what about when it comes to personal branding and influencers i know reebok now is partnered with conor mcgregor um you know i know you guys have made a lot of strategic plays and i don't know your your current level of involvement with the company I, I know you left but i'm sure they call you all the time for you know advice or insight or whatever but i'm curious what advice do you have for entrepreneurs now about the importance of building you know a brand but also now i'm, sh I'm sure you've seen the trend about ceos and leaders of companies kind of having a personal brand as well whether them being the face of the company or being more out there What's your pulse on how important um, branding of companies are versus personal branding? Are they both important? How do you, how do you see it? Well, <clears throat> in today's landscape moving I, I, forward in business. Yeah, I do think that uh, creating a brand is uh, is quite <clears throat> expensive, and even today it will take you some time. Um, and that you have to put a face to it. There's always really been a face to to many brands. For me, it was really building Reebok. I mean, that was it. I, in those days, I was pushing Reebok. <clears throat> Very few people know Joe Foster. Yeah, because Phil Knight, even Phil Knight with Nike, <clears throat> I know he recently came out with his book Shoe Dog, and you know, recently yeah. has has built the brand. But historically, he wasn't too much about building his brand, although you would hear about him. And so, I think the pulse has really changed from decades prior, where kind of CEOs or leaders kind of had more of a backseat type of, they were focused on building the company's brand, but now people are building yeah. the company and their <clears throat> personal brand. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, well I agree. <clears throat> I, uh, I, I, I have probably shared the same time scale uh, as, uh, as Phil Knight. Mm -hmm. we, and I've read his book and there are quite a lot of things where we we, <clears throat> we didn't meet but you know we were almost uh, on a on a level in a different thing and he was building nike and and i agree you know he was an accountant so he was more interested in sort of how the company works than being phil knight the the number one uh, i'm the guy who did it but then again there was bill borman at those days i mean bill borman was probably <clears throat> as much if not more influential than than, than phil knight because right. he was a coach mm. and uh, yeah, you know, I think it's a mixture of whichever way you go. Uh, but I think now we, we're talking social media, we're talking technology. So I, I think, you know, it's like, you know, Bezos, you know, you, you've got to, you know, he, he becomes a name, even though he all now only owns a small part of the company, but he, it's a big name. Uh, and I think that now there is that, that connection be between the name, Bill Gates, you know, you, you, you know the names now. And, and I think if you're going to do it, yes, uh, be, be prepared to uh, put yourself up there as well because of this, because we now have Zoom, because we now have faces. You know, Reebok is not a face. Reebok is a company, it's a brand, and it can't sit there and speak to you or you speak to me. So I think you have to have somebody now who can, yeah, be the brand. I, I, yeah. I think that people have got to think of that now. <clears throat> I love that. And how important was, you know, our show's called The Passionate Few. How important has passion been um, in your life and obviously during the days of building the company? How important was passion? And did you see a lot of entrepreneurs burn out on their ideas because they were pursuing money um, as a primary objective more than just actually having a love for it? I mean, it seems like to ride the roller coaster of success and like you said, kind of anticipate the challenges, there must have been a lot of passion getting you through those days where money wasn't getting you through those days. So how important do you think passion is to have success or at least fulfillment in your life and business? Because I'm sure you've seen entrepreneurs who had passion and some who kind of didn't, and you've kind of seen the results of that as well. Well, I think passion is almost the number one for me. If you don't have the passion, you don't have love, you don't have the drive and the energy. I think you have to live your, your ideal. And uh, I think if without the passion, I can't see anybody going anywhere. I, I, you just got to have passion. I, I think being in love with something, you know, it's a love affair, whatever it is, with where you're going. And you, you go that extra mile because it doesn't hurt you anymore. You know, that passion just takes away any hurt. Uh, even when you know, somebody throws something at you, 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 you meet something difficult. You know, the passion takes you through because 
you know, you've done it before, you'll do it again. And, you know, and that's it. There is no straight road. You will always hit the bumps. And that's where the passion keeps you going. Uh, and I, and I, I firmly believe it's passion and, uh, you know, you, you've got to have loyalty too. You've got to have that. Something in there that, that really makes people, when they look at you, feel that, wow, yeah, I like it. Yeah. It's like you doing your product. You know, yeah. That's it, because you, you've got to represent that. I love that. Well said from a billion dollar entrepreneur, because I think the passion will get you through when logic can't. Because if an obstacle shows up and you're being logical or it's about the money, you go, shoot, what do we do? Oh, no. But if you're passionate, you, the, you have reservoirs of creativity. What about the creative solutions? You're willing to find the person that can help you. And that passion, like you said, gives you that extra bump of energy. Um, I want to ask you this. Looking back, um, what advice would you give to the younger Joe Foster who was aspiring for success, maybe those early years, maybe things you would have done differently? Simultaneously, this would be advice to a young Joe Foster out there or Julie Foster, if you will, who are, you know, aspiring to, to, to do things in their life and maybe watching this interview and thinking, man, I want to do something awesome. What wisdom being on this side of the fence would you impart to a younger, ambitious man or woman trying to make their vision a reality? What, what would you have done differently? Would you have given yourself advice to stay calm under pressure? I mean, what insights come to mind on that? I, I think when you, when you look back on your life, you think, oh, I could have done without that. I could have done without that. And, but the, the things that uh, you really could have done without, you can't change. Jeff died. I could have done without that. You know, it's like, <clears throat> but, you know, by the late 1980s, Reebok had overtaken Adidas, had overtaken Nike. We become number one. So every time I think back about that, what if you have done that differently? Would you have still been a number one? Yeah. As it happened, for good, for bad, for the worst, <clears throat> for the agonies, for the problems and the split decisions, um, it worked. <clears throat> so whatever, whatever decisions, how can I change something that worked? And then it, that's what makes it difficult when I'm asked a question like, what would you change? Yeah, yeah. The only things I could change, I, I can't change. You know, I can't change the fact that uh, somebody dies. It, 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 it's destroying at the time, but you you have that passion again, and you you can work through it. But you know, there are, there are many things that uh, that went wrong, but and there are many failures. But it, what would I have done without that? Would I, would I not have learned a lesson? Would I, would right. I not have been able to rise to it, you know? So as it happened, we got there mm. and we got there pretty big. No, in a massive way, your impact has been phenomenal. So thank you for what you've done in the world. And when you left the company, you had mentioned that was 1989. Did you sell it at that point or how did you exit the company? Just to give the audience context of, of, of that. I'd, I'd sold the company earlier and uh, that was to make sure that it had a future. Because, mm. and, and when I got out, it was time for me to go. And, mm. and I think this is a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people. Yes, it might, you might be a person, but please understand there's a time when you move. You know, mm. if it's a company, it needs, it needs the freedom to grow. So sometimes you can get people sitting in a company and the company can lose its energy purely and simply because it needs a different direction. So I needed a different direction also. But like you were saying, it's a bit like the Eagles and the Hotel California. You know, you can check out, but you can never leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and where was the and company, where was the company revenue-wise at the time that you exited? You, you had mentioned it was about- Four billion. Four billion. So, so when you sold the company, was there, obviously, it was probably the biggest financial payday of your life. Did you notice anything change? Was there like a, uh, you know, was it, was it as, what is, was it as magnificent as, um, you know, the average person will probably never sell a company that's doing billions in revenue. From, from a man who's experienced it, what did it feel like the day the money cleared and you had it? Was it a sense of pride, excitement, what's next? Or, you know, what, what did that feel like? Well, I mean, as I say, I sold before, and you know, the money for me was not the objective. 
the objective mm -hmm. for me was Reebok in those days and to make it successful. So the money never was a, a big amount of money. And for me, it wasn't that big. It, it was a challenge. And so leaving, leaving the company, I knew it was the time now where I don't need to be here. And, mm -hmm. and, and money was not. I have a challenge now. And my challenge is the book. So I, I, you know, I, I live on the challenge. The money is not the important area to this. It is how do we, how do we get this to a bestseller in the USA? And that's mm -hmm. what the challenge is. So it's challenges that uh, I'm more interested in than just having a lot of money. I would probably sit back and not be heard of again. I, I don't know. I, I, I would have probably drunk myself to, uh, <laughs> to oblivion by now had it just been sitting there just look, counting the money and enjoying money. Uh, so, no, challenge for me. And, uh, you know, I've had a great life. And right now we're, we're living in France. And without COVID, we're always on the move. I have so many friends. I go to Italy. We go to, to meet Umberto Colombo, who was our distributor in, in Italy. And we drive up Sacramento, which is a nice hill just outside of Milan and Varese. And we can sit there and look over Lake Como, look over the lakes and enjoy it with the men, who, the people who are with us at the time when we're really enjoying life. And, that, and that's wow. great. Nice, nice to reflect. I reflect on your victory lap. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Joe, and sharing your incredible story. Um, and for those of you guys interested, make sure to check out the new book, Shoemaker. It just came out a few months ago, but you guys have to check it out. I'm halfway through it myself. And it's an incredible story about, um, you know, a man on a mission, your journey with your brother and what you've breathed into the world is unbelievable. Who would have thought that one day uh, a word in a dictionary uh, that, would, that was, uh, that was uh, an animal, a giraffe, would one day change because of uh, the energy and passion you put into it. So I wanna thank you, Joe, for what you've done in the world. And I wanna thank you for being one of the passionate few and sharing your incredible story. And um, I look forward to one day after COVID uh, flying down to you and interviewing you in person as well to, to dig through this story even more. So thank you so much for being on the show today. That would be a pleasure, Omar. And uh, thank you, thank you for the invitation. It's great. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the book. Absolutely. Will do. Any final words of wisdom to um, people out there who are looking at your story, inspired by what you've done and trying to make their life work, maybe through the challenges or anything, any quick quotes, tips, um, you know, good pieces of advice. I love that you also mentioned earlier in the interview uh, that, you know, sometimes you don't want to take too much advice from people, right? Because, because sometimes and I'm sure this has happened to you where your intuition might have said, hey, Joe, do this crazy idea. It could work. But accountants and lawyers and everybody else in the business said, no, that's a stupid idea. Um, you know, any advice to people on that? As, and this is the final question, I promise. <laughs> um, because a lot of <laughs> entrepreneurs deal with this. They have an inspired, intuitive, ah, maybe I should do this or the crazy ideas. And everyone around them is saying no. And I know I've been in that situation where you can get almost uh, too much advice and then you get paralyzed. Um, any advice on, on how to navigate those things, trusting yourself versus others? Well, I, I think that it's, it's very simple. And that is if you have a dream, if you have an idea, make sure you know what it's about and then just, just have a go, just keep going. I think if you keep going, you will win. You might get a lot of deviations, whatever it is. But, you know, have fun. That's the thing. Really have fun. Three most important things. Fun, fun, and fun. And <laughs> if you go for that, with a smile, with, a, with passion and with integrity, yeah, those, those are the things to go with. And then, yes, who knows? Yeah? Who yeah. knows? If, if, any, if anybody knew, they'd be there before you. But who knows? Just take that, just take that road. I love that word spoken beautifully by a billion dollar entrepreneur from Reebok. Thank you so much, Joe, for being on the show. And uh, again, if you guys want to check out, grab the book Shoemaker. We'll put a link in the description below. Make sure to grab your copy today. Trust me, you guys won't regret it. Cheers. And until next time, live strong, live with passion, and I'll see you guys on the next Inspiring. If you guys enjoyed that video, be sure to hit that subscribe button right now because every week we bring you the very best in personal development content, interviews, and insights to help inspire you to take your life and your dreams and make them a reality.
And also, if you want to know how to book dream guests the same way I have, you can check the link below for my top three secrets. So if you have a podcast or a show or whatever it is and you want to collaborate with them, if you click that link below, I'll give you those top three secrets to help you get in touch with anybody. And also, don't forget that The Passionate View is available on media platforms as well. So you can subscribe to the podcast. And until next time, thank you for being one of The Passionate Few.